Praise God. Amen. If you want to get Matthew's Gospel this morning again, I'm going to do a part two on the last time I was preaching, which is two weeks ago. Uh, if you weren't here, it's it's uploaded on the channel and the YouTube. It's Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16. Father, I do pray for this word that you will cause an anointing to be upon it, that regardless of who's listening to it or when it's being listened to, I pray that there will be, Father, the Holy Spirit bringing a fresh understanding, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, Father, that you will reveal Christ, which is the most important thing, and his work, Father, in our time and in our day, in our generation, in Jesus' name. Father, we want to see you glorified, and we want to see the work of our Lord Jesus Christ, High and filled full of glory, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. High and lifted up. So we read from Matthew 16, 13. And I was building upon these scriptures. Now, there's a lot in these scriptures. So it's very, very hard to get through it in one message. And certainly, I don't think that I could say that anybody could get through it in any length of time. Because it's like, it's... Um, it's so important, these scriptures, as I said the last time, they're foundational. Uh, it's foundational. This is the first time that the church is mentioned in the New Testament, where Jesus referred to his assembly, the body of Christ, whatever you want to call it, as the church. And, um, you know, we may look at a little bit of that this morning, but the word church uh, in the Greek is ecclesia, which literally translated means the called out ones. And that really describes it well, doesn't it? That, you know, what is a church? Well, a lot of people traditionally think it's like a building with a steeple and blah, blah, blah. That is not what that word was intended for. It was for an assembly of people that God called out, you know, and into his body, in Jesus' name, into his family. Okay? So this is, it was kind of like a radical term, really, that Jesus was saying, my church, my called out ones here. So this is the first time this is mentioned here. And then Christ, of course, then mentions in here too, you know, the foundational truth here, that it will be in Christ and in him that we are saved. Praise God. Or his church is saved from death, saved from Hades, saved from all these things. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. And yet, saints, you know, we can struggle sometimes. And really have to go back and revisit that truth over and over again. That it's us in Christ that matters. Because a lot of people have this perception, and I know my own self, sometimes I can, you know, we can deceive ourselves thinking that God will improve us. God will strengthen us. You know, God will add to us. God, you know, we, we, but we're thinking in terms of God taking, you know, the unsaved version of ourselves revamping and refurbishing us well that's not the case at all he's talking about us dying to ourselves and then an exchange taking place of the strength of christ being put into our lives the salvation and the righteousness of christ in our lives you know the intercession the you know the connection with god uh, of christ in our life by the holy spirit so we are effectively living his life you know through us christ in us the hope of glory praise the lord I'm throwing that out there this morning in words, English words, but I'm depending on the Holy Spirit to give you some sort of revelation. And I know it's not going to be all revelation, but it'll be something that you can build, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So will we read down to the scriptures here? We'll add to them this morning from the things that we spoke about last week. And I certainly want to get to verse 19, which is, the, is where um, I wanted to talk about you know the power of God in the church and so let's read verse 13 says um, Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi he asked his disciples saying who do men say that I the son of man am now I already have said that this is very important for lots of reasons one it's in the Bible two Jesus actually it came up with this question you know Jesus occasioned this subject the apostles didn't start talking about who was Jesus Jesus says who do men say that I the son of man am so Jesus introduced this question. He introduced this subject because he wanted their minds to think about it, because he wanted to bring it to their attention. And since there's many things in our lives on the earth, you know, that we'll never even get close to where God wants us to be. He will introduce things into your life. 
He will introduce subjects to you. He will expose you to things to cause you to think outside of your comfort zone. You know, go to places that you would never think of going. Who would have ever thought? I would never have thought in my life that I would end up in an Iskillin. Not the same that I'm going to end up in an Iskillin, but I'm here today. And I was talking to Pastor Gordon, 32 years on, still standing behind this pulpit, still preaching the gospel. Do you know why I do that? Because Christ wants me to do it. Jesus asked me to do it. He made himself very clear that I would do this. And I'm doing it for him. Praise the Lord. And I love doing it for him. Amen. But before that time, before that week, in January 1990, I never, well, I did hear of Inniskillen, but it never crossed my mind only for a little time that you passed by on the way to Belfast. <laughs> and that was it. I had no other ties, no other bindings with Inniskillen. I had no endearments to the place. You know, I had nothing in the place. I didn't even stop here for petrol, I don't think. Praise the Lord. Until the guys called to my house one Thursday night and says, do you want to go to church? Or sorry, I can't remember. Yeah, the, the first contact was, I got a phone call from Ethan Nixon who says, um, she asked to speak to Tony Kennedy. Tony happened to be in the house at the time. He says, hang on. I said, he's actually here. He went out, that was back in the day before mobile phones, guys, back in 1990. Cast your minds back. The phones were black. You had to dial the number by going, Bring, you know those sort of phones? You lift the phone up. You had to pay a bill at the end of the month. You didn't know who was phoning you until you lifted it and went, hello. <laughs> Anyways, long story short, the lady wanted a testimony in this church. I brought Tony down here, and this was the first introduction I had in this girl. Praise God. Amen. 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 So God changes your paths. He does. Yeah, so let's be open to that. And that's what God was doing here to his disciples. So he said to them, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And Jesus said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Now the important thing to notice here was that there was lots of answers came from the world. There was one answer came from Peter here. The one answer that came from Peter was from heaven. The answers that came from the world was from the world. Okay, so we can see that clear distinction here. Which one mattered? The one that came from heaven. Yes. And you see, we need to understand as Christians that the Holy Spirit reveals things to us, that this is where you are and where you need to be in terms of <clears throat> knowing things, mm -hmm. things that are right, things concerning the kingdom, things concerning interpreting the word of God. You know, and even Christians can get very floppy and fuzzy and scared about stuff like this. I'm quite confident in what I believe in. Because I know that it comes via the Holy Spirit. Praise God. And that's why Jesus stopped Peter and he says, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Peter heard from God. Now that was not exceptional. That's the standard quota for all the saints of God. Did you know that? Now let's turn really quickly to 1 Corinthians. Can you go there? 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And I want to show that to you in the Word. I hadn't really planned just to say this bit, but I will say it in passing because I feel a, an urge from the Holy Spirit to say it to you. Okay, so we have 1 Corinthians in chapter 2. And then we'll say from verse 9. So Paul was talking to the Corinthian church about, you know, I'd say, that, say the function of the Holy Spirit in your life. And he says here, but I hasn't, uh, sorry, it has been written, I has not seen, neither ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of, of uh, man, the things that God has prepared for them that love him. But God has revealed them unto us by his spirit. spirit. Okay. And then he, he goes on, he actually, he brings more um, um understanding to this he says for the spirit searches all things yet the deep things of god what man knows the things of man save the spirit that's in him even so the things of god knows no man but the spirit of god now we have received not the spirit of the world but the spirit which is of god so you've as a christian you have not received the spirit of the world you got him cast out of you actually you see that in ephesians chapter 2 
Okay? okay. We were dead in trespasses and sin. <laughs> we received the Holy Spirit. So now you have um, the Spirit of God. We have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know, or we could also say, for the purpose of, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. So what does the Holy Spirit do? The Bible calls him in John's Gospel the Spirit of Truth. He's continually communicating to you regarding the Kingdom of God, regarding the Word of God, regarding the, you know, the, the nature of God, you know, he can, he's revealing to you at heart level. Okay? Now listen to me. This is important. Not at language level. Not at intellect level, but at heart level. Because that's where we battle. We battle with the language. Does it say this? Does it say that? Is it a verb? Is it a noun? What does the Greek say? That's the thing. But as you meditate it in your heart, the Holy Spirit takes it to your heart, into your soul where the emotion is where your feeling is, where your understanding, where your tuition is. And you know it's God speaking to you because it's God. Think of a little baby in his mother's arms. That baby can smell the scent of his mother. He trusts his mother. He feels the warmth of her body. He doesn't feel threatened as he draws close to take milk from the mother, but will feel the warmth of the milk and feels that sense of security, sense of trust. And that child doesn't even know one English word. And yet it has all that intuition, all that instinct. And God has built that into nature. You look at the nature programs and you'll see the sea turtles giving birth to their eggs, or maybe that's what the correct term is, way up in the beach banks. And then when the little turtles are born, they'll run straight for the shoreline, not the other way. And they'll flip flop, flip flop, flip flop, flip flop, and they'll make this journey of 100 meters or whatever it is, totally blind, totally in the dark, totally at risk of all the predators who would see them as a lunch. And they make it all the way down into the water and go off for a swim. And God puts this in his natural world. Amen? We see it all the way out through the animal kingdom. I've seen the most wonderful thing uh, uh, a, a kangaroo, of all things, giving birth to its yeah. little young. And the wee young does climb out of the mother, literally, and up into the pouch, down into the pouch, binds the nipple yeah. and starts to feed on the milk. And it's no bigger than a little it's earthworm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the mother does not assist it with one, it just lies there and lets it do its <laughs> business. And yet that's in nature. Since Jesus says this, my sheep know my voice. We could Amen. amplify it Amen. by saying, my sheep have the instinct and knowledge Amen. of my voice. Amen. They will Amen. not run from me. They will know the, the wolf. They will know the, the false uh, shepherds. Amen. But they, will, they know Christ's voice. Hallelujah. And that's why I'm saying this morning that as the spirit you've received, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God. That you might know the things that are freely given to you of God. Also described as the spirit of truth in John's gospel chapter 16. Okay? And he will reveal unto you all truth. So this is where we are. So what Peter, Peter is not, you know, special Peter here. Peter is one of the middle Christian Peter here at this stage. You follow what I'm saying? Well, it's, it's, it's a blessed thing to be. Because Jesus says, blessed art thou, Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood is not revealed unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Now the last thing... And I'll just say it to you about this is that this is where we need to get all our understanding, all our knowledge, and all our truth. Okay? Saints, I even heard it said by a Christian, and this is not radical. This actually it is radical, but it's actually the truth. That we should be very careful about all the information that we gather from any other source. Be careful of it. Now look at I'm not one of these people that you know you're not going to find out how to do a tracheotomy in the Bible. So doctors need to go to their medical journals to know how to do that. Okay? You need to go to a cookbook to find out how to cook a good lasagna. Alright? Or you might need to go to a songbook to learn how to sing and sing a good song. Isn't that right? So all these things are human skills. But in terms of the Holy Spirit, in terms of the Kingdom of God, we need to be careful how we gather information that we build upon the Kingdom of God with. You know, don't let the world dictate to you, like Kathy is saying that her dog was really sick, and yet she believed God. 
you know, I believe my dog's in bother because he's got one kidney now and the other kidney's not working great. But Jesus spoke to me and he says, anything you'll ask in my name, I will do it. Amen. So I prayed over my little fella and says, you do well in Jesus' name. Yes. Praise God. And I'm praying for him. I'm praying for him. And I'm bringing something more than the world to this situation. Now, I agree with the vet. I looked at the bloods and I looked at all the, the results and I agree with her. I says, yes, this is what the bloods are saying. Yeah. But I agree with the word of God as a, it would supersede those truths in Jesus' name. So I'm not denying I am superseding. You follow what I'm saying by when I say that? Praise God. We could do lots of testimonies on that, but we won't for time's sake. So saints, you can read on this a bit further. It goes into it. Paul really breaks it down here. Um, he says the natural man receives not the things of the spirit. Okay. That's that's basically in a nutshell why the world will argue with you regarding Christ and regarding religion regarding fanaticism and all this sort of stuff that comes out of religion because the natural man receives not the things of the spirit of God for their foolishness unto him and neither can they know them because they're spiritually discerned but he that is spiritual judges all things for he himself is judged of no man who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him but we have the mind of Christ okay wonderful words there amen okay so let's go back to peter so blessed art thou simon bar jonah for flesh and blood is not revealed unto thee but my father which is in heaven verse 17 and i say unto peter that thou art sorry uh, jesus said this in verse 18 i say unto thee that thou art peter and upon this rock i will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it okay now i think the temptation here is to get lost in the weeds <laughs> don't get too bogged down and lost in the weeds here Jesus was just making an example here. He was using Peter's name in kind of like a cross. I don't know what the proper English terminology here, but the word Peter means stone. stone. Yeah. Right, it's Petro, Petros. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus said, what you've just said is foundational. I'm actually going to build my church upon this, that I am the Christ, the son of the living God. Okay, so what you said, Peter, is right and is truth. And there's a lot of play in this. Now, I don't, we don't want to get too into it this morning because you could spend the whole morning going through it. But from John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 14, right? Have a quick look at that again because I think this is, you'll see what this was doing. Jesus is nicknaming his disciples. And Jesus nicknamed Simon Barjona the first minute he laid eyes on him. Yeah. He said, you will be called Cephas, which means a stone, right? And that comes from the... Hebrew word kepha, which is rock, okay? K A F E, rock. And I think, I'm not sure whether Cephas or Kephas is the correct pronunciation. Kephas. It could be Kephas, right? Which comes from the Hebrew word rock, right? And it's like, as I said last week, uh, Dwayne Johnson, the big actor, they call him the rock. And they don't call him the rock because he likes to throw stones. They call him the rock because he looks like a rock. He's built like a rock. <laughs> Isn't that right? Rocky was the same, the boxer. Remember Rocky Barboa, um, Kenny? They called him Rocky because it was like punching a stone. <laughs> you know, he was tough, tough, tough. And when you're building a building, it has to be on a load bearing base, which they call a foundation. Isn't that right? Mm -hmm. So you can be sure that this building here, which is a heavy building, is built upon a heavy foundation. <laughs> And the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is built upon a heavy foundation, a load bearing foundation. What? is that foundation that foundation is the fact that jesus is the chosen one of god the son of the living god he was sent forth by god he is anointed by god and empowered by god which is the term christ okay so he is the chosen and completely empowered one by god to be the savior of all mankind hallelujah and that's what jesus was really talking about here so I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it upon that rock. So we really have got to get ourselves into that mindset and into that thinking that we are in him, in Christ, in him all the time. Paul talked about in Jesus, in Christ all the time. Because the minute you can see yourself in Christ, in him, the less you will see of yourself. The less you will be judging yourself and disqualifying yourself so you were no good in the first place. So what's the point in trying to qualify something that's a bit of rubbish anyway? Amen? That's what we do though, isn't it? 
we go in there saying, oh, I'm great, not fully great, but I'm better than him and better than her. Surely God will accept me. But that's comparing yourselves by yourselves, and that's not what we need to be. We need to see, see ourselves completely lost mm. outside of Jesus Christ, in need of his salvation, in need of his cross. Yeah. Now, there's some wonderful teachings all through the scriptures and the epistles there. In Ephesians chapter 2, in Ephesians chapter 1, it talks of us about being buried with him, crucified with him and resurrected with him and seated with him in heavenly places so we are in christ in him seated with him in heavenly places and that's where the power of the revelation of your walk and your power and your authority is in that if you can see yourselves in heavenly places in christ jesus we are absolutely where we should be in terms of revelation understanding but once we bring ourselves and our own strength and our own qualifications into the equation, that's when we start to fall over. Like Peter, that's where you start to sink in the water. <laughs> Amen. When you take your eyes off Christ. Mm. Hallelujah. Now this is where we ask Kathy to put this up. I'll say it to you. Oh, we're back there again. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. No, this is fine. We go there because I, I know the time goes on quickly. So um, Jesus said to Peter, who was Simon Barjona, also nicknamed Kephas, the stone. <laughs> Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for you've got yourself a revelation from God. He said, and, but what you just said, he says, Peter, he says, upon this foundation of rock, I'm going to build my church. I'm going to call people out. Call people out of this world. Mm -hmm. I'm going to build my church. And he says this, he said the gates of hell. Now we had a look at this last week. I'm not going to spend time on it this week. That word is the actual word Hades. And it doesn't, it's translated hell here. Really quickly, there's three words in the New Testament for hell. One is Hades. The other is Gehenna, which is the place of damnation. If you get judged and damned, you go to Gehenna. If you're just going to die and go to the grave, it's called Hades. Right, the place called Hades. So Abraham was in Hades. Lazarus was in Hades. The rich man was in Hades. It was the grave. David said he was going to go to Hades. You know, It's just the place of the departed. That's what it was referred to. So it's not hell. When we talk about hell in our culture, it's, it's a place of, there's not a snowball chance in hell of getting out of there. Isn't that what they say? Yeah. Because they think hell is the last, you know, once you go to hell, you're goosed. Isn't that it? Yeah. You're judged. Mm -hmm. But that is not what Jesus was saying here at all. He was saying that he's conquering death and the grave. That's what he was saying. I'm going to raise up people conquering death and the grave. So he has conquered death and the grave in you. All right. You are now born again. You seated at the right hand of God. When you leave this earthly body, you will be instantly with the Lord. And... He will fulfill one step further on the last day he will give you a brand new body so death and hell is completely no hold on you praise god isn't that wonderful mm -hmm. amen mm -hmm. so he said he's going to deliver his people completely from death and from hell and this is what he's talking about here mm -hmm. so the church of the lord jesus christ he's going to give life to all these people but he's going to deliver them from the position of being captured in hell so we were captured in hell. The only way out of hell is through the cross, through Jesus. Yeah. Through Jesus. Yeah. And that's why he said that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Okay? Now, you know, if you, if you walk by a house and there's three big Doberman pincers behind the gates, you're hoping that the gates will prevail against those dogs. Isn't that right? Otherwise, if it doesn't prevail, if those dogs can burst open that gate, you can run for your life. Isn't that it? But Jesus said that the gates of hell will not prevail. In other words, they will burst open. And hell will deliver up people unto life because of the cross. He made example of it. He called Lazarus forth. Isn't that right? Come forth. He came out of death. He came out of the grave. Amen. So that's what Jesus was referring to there. Delivering his people completely from death to life. Is that okay? Now, let's go on a little bit more. Um, I suppose if we had just a minute we could I wanted to look at one thing briefly because I thought it was very interesting when you go to 1st Peter chapter 2 verse 4 this is the same Peter right it seems like this revelation of Christ building his church 
and using the analogy of a building and stones and foundations and building up, you know, Peter used that same terminology in his own epistle here in 1 Peter chapter 2. And I only take a minute with this, but I just wanted to touch on it. Is that okay? Yeah. I'd say Christ made an impression on Peter just at this point here. Peter was remembering this. Now, 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, say verse 1. Where if I lay aside all malice and all guy, hypocrisies, evil, uh, envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babies, which we were talking about already, praise the Lord, desire the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. If so, be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious, to whom coming as unto a living stone. Okay, so Peter himself is talking about stones here. Disallowed indeed of men, but chosen, excuse me, of God and precious. You also are lively stones built together, a spiritual house, yeah. a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Yeah. Okay, so Peter is putting his own, you know, I'm sure Peter went off and thought about all this. He says, yeah, the church, living stones, Jesus is himself, the cornerstone. Mm -hmm. And then it talked about Christ in verse 6 here, about him being rejected. It says, wherefore, uh, it is contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone. Now the cornerstone was the, I don't want to go into this too, too deep because I don't know a lot about it, but um, I do know that in old times when they built a building, you put in a cornerstone, and Joe, you might know a bit more about this, but that cornerstone was like a reference. It was a reference for levelness and all sorts of, you know, positions. So they used the cornerstone as the reference. That was like the datum in the building, okay? So if you want to check whether your line of this wall was correct, you went back to the cornerstone. You know, you built upon the cornerstone. Am I right or am I way off the mark here altogether? I've got a thumbs up from a, a certified builder at the back here. So this is the truth. The cornerstone is the reference that your building is right, okay? They boast about the pyramids that these things are right to within millimeters. All these stones are cut perfectly, right? And there will be cornerstones in these as well. But we have one cornerstone in our Jesus building. Christ. His name is who? Jesus. Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Okay, so um, you can go, and again, as it says, we're, we're crossing over a lot of stuff. Let's go back because time, and you can look at that yourselves. But we are, um, the Bible says, living stones built up together a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable unto God by Jesus Christ. And it says that we are a chosen generation, we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that we might show forth the praises of him. Amen. Who call us unto darkness into light. Paul said in Ephesians 2, verse 20, verse 20 22, ye are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord in whom ye also are built together for a habitation of God through his Holy Spirit. So what is the purpose of the church? It's for a habitation or a living place for God to dwell among us. Isn't that wonderful? Praise God. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. It's a bit of a teaching this morning. Are you okay? Are you hanging in there? Hallelujah. Will you give me five more minutes? Because the good, the best is yet to come. <laughs> okay. Um, so let's get on to um, the next scripture. And then Matthew... Um, 16 verse 19 says but i will give unto you and i will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven so jesus just told peter peter the christ the son of the living god this is the start you know i'm going to break open the gates of hell we're going to build our church upon that and he says um, and then he says i will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven okay and whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. Now these are key scriptures, saints, for you to meditate upon. Because when you look at this, this is awesome. The Bible talks about in the book of Revelation, Jesus Christ having the keys of death and hell. What does that mean? It means that he has the authority now. The authority belongs to Jesus Christ. I own this place. If I have the keys of that door, I own this place. Okay, now I know loose analogy, but you can see that. But definitely, 
Jesus has the keys of death and hell. Now he said he's given unto us the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Now, number one, we need to understand the kingdom of heaven, which is important. That we're not, and, and since I'm saying this, and I know I'm preaching to the choir this morning, I know you understand. When Jesus came, he didn't start preaching solo salvation runs, he started preaching the kingdom. This will be a gathering, a community, a kingdom of people. He will be the king. Amen. Now, I know the Jehovah's Witnesses are all over this revelation, and they all really build and hold together their kingdom based upon these kingdom principles. You know, one of them asked me about that one time. He says, what do you think of the kingdom? And I says, well, if, if it's a kingdom, I says, there will be a king. <laughs> and his name is Jesus. So I was able to go at him from that side. But I very much understand that there's two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of this world, the kingdom of the devil, and the kingdom of Antichrist, and then the kingdom of, of God, and the kingdom of heaven, and the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we need to understand that two of them are in conflict with each other. They're chalk and cheese, black and white. One kingdom is coming to rule and to reign and to crush the other kingdom. Okay? That is the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. We are in transition. I don't know if that's the correct term, but maybe it is a term to use at the moment. In transition in terms of part of the kingdom of God is in heaven. Part of the kingdom of God is on the earth. And we are policing and evangelizing until Jesus comes back and sets up his rule upon this earth so we're in the position right now where the devil is ruling the Antichrist is ruling and you're here as an ambassador setting for the Lord Jesus Christ but Jesus says I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven so you will have down here the authority of the kingdom of heaven praise God okay now we need to look at this and understand this because this is, this is very very important to our service to God he says I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven now I want you to notice one thing this morning in the short time that I have with you I'm trying to pick out the most important things that I think might make sense here this morning he didn't say that the other way around he didn't say whatsoever is bound in heaven I want you to go then and bind it on the earth he said it the other way around. Let's, yeah. let's, let's <laughs> break it all around here. <laughs> let's have a wee seal a moment here. Is that what we say in the Psalms? Yeah. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. He didn't say it the other way around. He said, whatsoever you shall bind on earth, heaven's going to follow and bind it in heaven. Now, I really believe that it's even closer than that. Now you don't have to believe this because this is Alan's own theology, <laughs> my own opinion. I believe that as you are binding on earth, you are heaven binding. Is that okay to say that? Yeah. Yeah. You, are the, you are the heaven that is binding on the earth. Okay? So we need to understand that there's binding and there's loosings. So like, take it a little step further then. We are in our service for Jesus creating change we're challenging things here we're challenging things that are one way and making it another way for Christ isn't that right we're saying that should not be like that that should be like that in Jesus name I now bind that I pray God's blessing on that and we speak the blessing we speak the word over that in Jesus name now the thing here is what happens is, is then we look at it and we wait for the change to happen. And you see, this is where it all falls down. We need to understand that when you speak it into the heavens, it is done in the heavens. Okay. It has happened, it has changed. And it will be like that sycamore tree, that, or the fig tree, that Jesus cursed from the roots. It will be still looking mighty pretty when Jesus cursed it. It was only the next day that they came along that it started to wither from the roots. Isn't that right? So it had an impact on it at that moment in time Jesus spoke. But it took time for it to change on the earth. So Christian, I want you not to focus on the earthly things as you see it, but I want you to focus on the heavenly things as you see it. So we're not looking at the earth, we're looking at heaven. So this is what this is talking about. You have the authority in the kingdom of heaven. To do things on this earth for Christ Jesus our Lord. And Jesus has said it 
really clearly. This scripture is like a thorn in the side of those that are full of unbelief. Because, saints, you know, you can't hide it. Jesus spoke things that are challenging. Amen? Now, let me just tell you in terms of, in terms of um, I need to go through a couple of scriptures here just to kind of um, put this all together. Jesus said this in John's Gospel, chapter 14, verse 12. And this is concerning the power that he was going to give you. Okay? Now, not authority, but power here. Power, right? He says, verily, verily, John Gospel, chapter 12, sorry, verse 14, verse 12, Kathy, sorry. 14, 12. Yeah. So he says, truly, truly, or verily, verily. Now, when Jesus says verily, verily, you know, I mean, he's really, he's bolting this down. So don't go looking for change in this verse. It's not going to happen. He's telling you. This is set in stone. There's that word stone again. <laughs> verily, verily, I say unto you that he that believes on me, the works that I do shall he do also. Okay? <laughs> and greater works than these shall he do because I go to my Father. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. You see that? Mm -hmm. You can look at that from the right, you can look at that from the left, from the top, from the bottom up. That will not change because he's put the burly, burly stamp on her. Yes. <coughs> Done. Set the stone. Can't change that. Okay? okay? The only thing we can do is destroy that by unbelief. That's right. Or we can validate it by faith yeah. and believe in God. Next one, Jesus said, John 15, verse 14, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you, that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. And whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Praise God. Amen? Whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Now, many people read this like this. Whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will then go off and have a good think about it and come back to you with, you know, a green light or a red light or a white light, an amber light. Isn't that right? That's how we think about it. But he says, no, he will give it to you. But it's all about how we see and how we perceive it. Have we time to look at Luke's Gospel, chapter 13, verse 10 to 15? I want to give you a quick example of Jesus using the same term terminology as Luke 13. Are you okay for five minutes? Yeah. yeah. I don't really like crossing over the one o'clock mark, but and that's just you, out of respect for your own time, you know. As I say, the doors aren't locked. If anybody needs to go over. Uh, 13 and then say verse 10. So the reason why I'm, I'm choosing these scriptures is because it's using the same terms as Jesus, as Jesus spoke to Peter about. Whatsoever you shall bind on earth, whatsoever you shall loose on earth. It's not, it's not kind of like a term that we'd use nowadays. It's only when you come into church you hear it. Isn't that right? I bind this, I loose that, you know? <laughs> what are you on about? <laughs> okay. So he was teaching in the synagogue on the Sabbath, and behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years, and she was bowed together. And could not rise, sorry, in no wise lift herself. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said, Woman, you are released from your infirmity. And he laid hands on her, and immediately she was made straight, and she glorified God. Okay? That's what happened. He saw the woman, she was bent in two. She, he called her, he says, Woman, come here. And then he spoke to her first, and he says, You're actually loose from your infirmity. She's still bent in two. Then he laid hands on her, and then the Holy Spirit set her free. Okay? Mm -hmm. So you can meditate on that on your own to see that. See it in your mind what actually happened here. Now, the ruler of the synagogue kicked off then and answered with indignation because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day, which was very important to these guys. Traditions. Okay? And said unto the people, There are six days in which men ought to do work, in them therefore come and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. And Jesus then answered him, you hypocrite. Imagine saying that to somebody in the church. You hypocrite. You ugly hypocrite. <laughs> oh, that's not very Christian of you, Jesus. Yes, it is. Jesus is all for the truth there, isn't he? Yeah, it's all for the truth. And do you know what really brought Jesus here? If that's the correct term to use, apologies if it's not. He was opposing the work of God. 
He was opposing Jesus doing the work of God. Yeah. That really got Jesus yeah. answering back. Okay? So that meant a lot to Jesus. He says, you hypocrite. Does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose, the, loose here's that term, loose his ox from the stall and lead him away in watering? Ought this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound, lo, these eighteen years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? So Jesus was using that terminology. And I'm sure, since if you were bent in two, like this poor old woman, eighteen years, you would feel bound. Mm. Of course you would. I'm bound. Yeah. I can't move. I can't visit my grandchildren. Mm -hmm. I can't go anywhere. I can't go to the seaside. I can do nothing. Mm -hmm. I can't even go to the toilet. I need help. I can't dress myself. I'm bound. Mm -hmm. And Jesus loosed the oh, bond. Yeah. Praise God. Oh, yeah. Just understand it a bit better. Yeah. Jesus used that himself. Isn't that right? Yeah, now, yeah. the other thing I want to show you, and I'm really I'm burning up the clock here. I know that since. But. Um, it's um, little, 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 apologies now I want to just drive home this point if you go to 2nd Kings chapter 6 um, of seeing things being done in heaven see what is done in heaven okay and don't root it up once you pray it's your faith holding that miracle together you have done the deal with God. Okay. It's based on a covenant. Mm -hmm. You have entered into a legal agreement mm -hmm. with God, ratified through the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. When you say, that person is now healed in the name of Jesus, you have put the blood of Jesus on that person. Amen. Mm -hmm. God forbid you would turn around a half an hour later or a day later and say the opposite. You're not healed in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that be horrible? Yes. And yet we do it all the time. Mm -hmm. We do that all the time. Mm -hmm. You know? And I, I, I'm using this very respectfully because I really, really respect this, um, mm -hmm. this teacher, Andrew Womack. I think he's a very bad guy. If you don't like him, I don't care. I love him. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's a great preacher. Anyway, he... He, he shows his warts and all. He shows his weaknesses. He shows everything. And he said to us one time, he said he got a word of knowledge. He said that there was a person here with ca cast eyes. So, it, it ca you know what cast eyes is? It's kind of like, basically their, head, their eyes are looking together like that. And he said there's somebody here with cast eyes. And he says before he knew it, there was a mother who had brought up a young child. Before him, and he says that eyes of the child were so cast that the child couldn't even see, they were pointing in opposite directions. And he looked at the child, and his own faith and his own mind, he was thinking, I'll pray a prayer, and God will eventually correct this. You know, God will start, there'll be an anointing, and the child will get anointed, and God's gonna, through a series of time, God will correct this. And this is what he was thinking. He laid hands on the child, put the thumbs over the child's eyes. And he said, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, he says, be straight. And he took his thumbs away. And he said, the, two ch the child's two eyes, he opened his eyes, and the both eyes were looking exactly at, at him, perfectly. Perfectly. And he, he said, out of shock, he said, I don't believe it. Now, he confessed this himself. He says, he just said this, I don't believe it. He said, instantly, the child's eyes went, no. And he wept and pleaded with God, repented in front of all the people. I didn't mean that in the name of Jesus, that those eyes never went back. Oh. And as he says this for the, you know, for the benefit, for the benefit of you servants of the Lord Jesus Christ, when you take that legal word of God into the courtroom of the kingdom of heaven, and ratified by the blood of Jesus, invoking heavenly rights and authority and power over a situation on the earth. Do not. It's held together by you. Do not unravel that because you have put it together and whatsoever you have bound on earth is bound in heaven. Amen. And also whatever you loose on earth Amen. shall be loose in heaven. Praise 
Praise God. Let's look at these scriptures, and we'll be closing very soon, and I apologize for running the clock too, too much. As I said, just out of respect for you and your time, I don't own you. I, don't, I just respect you and your fellow brother in the Lord. So this is in um, 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 16 and 17. Um, for the sake of time, I'll give a very, very quick introduction to this. This was Elijah, Elisha, excuse me, Elisha. And the king of Syria was trying to attack Israel. And every time the king of Syria made a plan, Elisha told the king of Israel what the plan was. Every time the king of Syria was going to make a camp here, Elijah had already told Israel, don't go there, he's going to be there. And this was going on not once, the Bible says not twice, but it's more than that, okay? Eventually the king of Syria got very frustrated and he said, which one of you is spying? Which one of you is for the king of Israel? And somebody said, nobody, my lord. It says, but in Israel there's a man of God who can tell the very words that you speak in your bedchamber. Anyways, the king of Syria put an army together when he found out it was Elisha and then surrounded Elisha with a complete army. <laughs> okay? So it sounded like Elisha was in a bad place. So they got up in the morning, pulled back the curtains, went... And they were looking around and all of a sudden there was the whole Syrian army outside. And actually it was the servant of Elijah actually saw it. And it said in verse 15, When the servant of the man of God was risen early and had gone out, behold, the host compassed the city, behold, with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, master, how shall we do? Okay, so basically he was saying, We're goosed. This is it. We're finished. They're going to string us up by the ten toes here and make, uh, what do you call those things that the kids do beat with the stick to get sweets out of? Oh, yeah. <laughs> They're going to make, what's it called, Johnny? Oh, <laughs> Pinata. Pinata. Anyways, things did not look good for Elisha. Things did not look good. And then Elisha just said in verse 16, Fear not. He says, For they that be for us are more than they that be against us. He says, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Mm -hmm. And you say, Elijah, go to Specsavers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, what is the matter? Well, you've got sunstroke. Yeah. Look out your window. Let's do this again. Elijah, the Syrian army's outside, and you're saying there's more with us than with them. Okay? So Elijah prayed in verse 17. He prayed and he said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountains were full of horses and the chariots of fire around Elisha. And when they had come to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, um, Smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness according to the word of God. And of course, read on the story, because it's, a very, it's an awesome story, that the, the Lord God smote the whole Syrian army with blindness, and Elisha <laughs> led them all on a merry walk right into the king of Israel. And the king of Israel is going, what am I going to do with these? He says, will I kill him? Will I kill him? Will I kill him? And Elisha says, no. Set a table before them and feed them and do things like that. Praise the Lord. Amen. Now, can I get a little political here just for a moment? <laughs> I remember, and God for, forgive me, anybody here that's traditional listening to this, but I remember years ago there used to be all this malarkey used to go on about marching and not marching and not being allowed to march and marching and fellas marching through areas and that they shouldn't be marching through and, and fellas coming out and protesting and all that. And I was thinking like, why not when the guys come through with their, their march, have tables out for them with coffees and cakes and everything and says, you are welcome. Have cakes and coffees. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Who thinks that wouldn't work? I think that would work. It would. Yep. It would absolutely unravel this whole thing. You know, we go. <laughs> you actually want us here? Please stop. <laughs> Anywho, uh, we won't get. We won't. That was my solution. It was never. It was never actually submitted to the house of whatever is down there as a suggestion. I don't think anybody would listen to me. But I thought it was a good suggestion. At the time, that rather than throwing stones and petrol bombs at these people, they could have set up cake stones. And, <laughs> and, 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 well, the Bible says love never fails, so I thought that would work. Anywho, um, you can read that on your own. Um, there's some awesome stuff here, but I want to show you this. 
Mm. Gehazar saw the Syrian army and he panicked. Elijah saw the Syrian army, but he saw something else. He saw heaven. Yeah. He saw more in the kingdom of heaven than with them. Chariots of fire and horses more than the whole Syrian army. So there was two kingdoms and he was able to see heaven. And that's what mattered. It was set in stone. And because he saw heaven, God was able to totally change the situation. Where Elijah just says, blind the army. They were blinded. They were going on like this. He led them right into the king of Israel. The king of Israel then sat them down, fed them all, confused them all, and sent them all back home again to their master. Praise God. It was the greatest kind of like, you know, I just, he just turned it on its head completely. Praise God. All because he could see heaven. And that's what I'm praying for. Now listen, two scriptures and we finish here. Ephesians 1, 18. Paul prays this for the standard saints. He says, he prays that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened. That you may know what is the hope of his calling. Okay? So if Jesus is giving unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, whatsoever you shall bind on earth, that you will see with the eyes of your understanding this being bound in heaven. Praise God. And you fortify that. And you confirm that. You certify it by your truth and your faith. This will happen in Jesus' name. Because it is said this way. Because Jesus has given unto me the keys of the kingdom of heaven. I have the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Amen. Praise God. I won't go any further. I'm going to leave it at that. Is that okay? Yes. Amen. Amen. So that's Matthew 16. Jesus said, I'll give, it to you, I'll give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. Praise God. And as I said, Peter was standard. Peter. He got a revelation. You and me got a revelation. Just say, praise God. Oh my goodness, give it time. Okay, let's pray.